Hey everyone, welcome back to TVUSA Live. I'm here with Isabel Brown, and we're about to bring in a very special guest. I am so excited. Andy No. I don't think anyone has done more courageous journalism than Andy No, especially over the past like half decade or so. What he's done to expose Antifa and what he's done teaming up with TPUSA has been incredibly courageous, incredibly inspirational, and so admirable. We're going to talk to him a little bit more about what happened at Dartmouth College because they had to cancel the event due to a bomb threat and more threats from Antifa. So upon further ado, welcome to TPUSA Live. Andy No, how are you? Thanks for having me on. It's my first time and I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks so much for spending some time with us. Give us your take on what happened at Dartmouth because obviously there was a bomb threat there and unfortunately you're used to getting a lot of threats from Antifa and when you tried setting up this event with Turning Point USA on that college campus, um, unfortunately they had to shut it down in person. Yeah, so it actually has confirmed that there was a bomb threat a bomb squad and bomb snip was sent through the building. What had happened, and this is sort of the cliche of left-wing political violence, is uh, I was invited along with Gabriel Nadales, who was a, a former participant in leftist uh, militant direct action, to speak at Dartmouth. And uh, we, I traveled across the Atlantic to, to get to New Hampshire. Um, my co-speaker traveled from the West Coast. And uh, two hours before the event uh, was set to happen, we found out that um, the administration had given an ultimatum to the student organizers, which is to accept a transition to a uh, Zoom meeting or nothing at all. And um, heartbroken, well, they accepted uh, the former, but by that point, there were already people traveling en route there from across New England. Um, what had happened once the event was announced um, days before is that Antifa accounts online and other anonymous extremist groups made threats of violence against the event and, and, violent, and threats of violence against me. Uh, one person said that if anybody managed to assault me and happened to be arrested, that he would contribute to the bail fund. Uh, wow. Others talked about coming on to the event. And sadly, um, this is to be expected. If you dare to talk about left-wing violence extremism, which is uh, what the subject of the event was supposed to be about, you'll get threatened with violence. And the thing that makes uh, Dartmouth College's uh, decision so cowardly is that the building was secure with dozens and dozens of police from uh, the local police department and neighboring police department, as well as the sheriff's office. So uh, I'm still trying to find out what information they received, if any, uh, that warranted that decision for them to cancel it. So far, all they've been saying is that they had safety concerns. Andy, unfortunately, you are no stranger to the violence of Antifa and the far political left. For those who may not be familiar with your story, can you walk us through where this all started for you in exposing what that radical arm of the leftist agenda looks like? I think what people need to know is that though Antifa's grand goal of toppling the United States is not going to happen. Um, what they are doing is transforming society in a way that makes people tolerant towards uh, political violence and left-wing extremism. You can see that after Trump was elected, we went through four and a half years of um, what should be respectable commentators in respectable publications and, and, and television shows. To, um, justifying uh, people who engage in violence against the right, people who carry out looting and rioting, as long as it's done for the right reasons. And I think all of that paves the ground, as we've seen, to legitimize uh, Antifa and, Antifa's violence and the violence of their allies. So you don't have to get rid of the First Amendment to create a society where people are actually really afraid to speak their mind. And then I know, too, it, it must be really tough to relive a lot of these really difficult experiences you, you've been through. And I know before we brought you on, I really don't know if there's anybody that's been more courageous in journalism than you, but you still keep going. What keeps you going and, and making sure you want to share these stories and make sure you actually really expose this far left ideology that has been unbelievably destructive in America? 
Um, I think this sounds maybe perhaps like a cliche, but what drives me really is the truth. Uh, I love the this country, the United States, um, accepted my parents in as refugees after they fled uh, the communist regime of Vietnam. And so for that, I owe a sense of gratitude to the country. And when you have a larger uh, understanding of um, how other societies are structured, how other political systems come to be, you really come to appreciate uh, the United States and its constitution and the fact that there are extremists who are operating in the open in front of us who are able to spread their lies into uh, the establishment press um, that for me I'm motivated to, to counter those lies often by simply either recording videos or bringing attention to videos that others recorded showing what these people actually do. Andy, you talk a lot in your book about how people assume the radical left are very disorganized. They don't have a cohesive game plan for achieving their means to an end here and completely changing American society. Uh, but they truly are very organized and they do take armed uh, training classes. They're really working together to work as a cohesive unit. What do you wish more people in the Western world knew about the behind the scenes of Antifa and how can we be more prepared to counter those threats in the future? I think people underestimate the radical left, the far left, because um, they organize in a way that's really multi-pronged. So uh, what's done, particularly in Washington, and, and people often focus on this, is like the lobbying and the politicians who are elected, who are, who are brought in, um, people like AOC and others. And even though these are not necessarily people who are calling for a direct overthrow of the government, they are mainstreaming and helping to mainstream uh, radical ideas. Uh, beyond that, you have people who are organized at the street level engaged in carrying out acts of violence and arson. They call this uh, militant direct action. And for that, that um, I think how it all comes together is that you have then people who carry out violence and promise violence to intimidate the public. And then you have those, their allies who are in institutions of power, such as local governments or um, even law enforcement, um, uh, state legislations, who t turn a blind eye to that violence. And so you can look to places like um, Portland and Seattle and parts of California, where on paper the laws look fine, but in, in reality you have um, really the the breaking down of the American city and the, the rise, you can see this in data of, of violent criminality and homicides. Mm, wow. It's absolutely insane to me too, because we're having conversations like this and you have a great book and everything you share on social media goes to show that Antifa is not just some sort of idea, President Biden. If you had a sit down conversation with President Biden, what would you tell him specifically about Antifa? And what would you have him do to make sure that he actually denounces this far left activist group? I think I would show him the videos because it's, if I was to let him know what I think, uh, he and others around him, it would be very easy to dismiss that and say that these are just Andy's views, this is Andy's interpretation. Um, I think if you show the videos, uh, it's, it's less deniable. And then I would show him the various court papers from um, local jurisdictions and, and even in federal cases of where um, these people admitted or the evidence uh, showed that they were motivated by their uh, far leftist beliefs. Um, and uh, I think I would help, I would try to hammer down the idea that Antifa is not just a threat to the American right or threat to people who support Donald Trump, but rather it's a, it's a threat to the entire American system. It's a threat to the Constitution. These are people who explicitly uh, talk about wanting to abolish the country itself, and you should take them at their word. Hmm. Andy, you have been come after directly over and over and over again by Antifa with threats of violence and even actual violence. Why do you think Antifa is so afraid of you specifically? Um, it's, I'm an easy target in that there aren't very many journalists uh, in the United States who focus full time on Antifa. And for me, 
um, primarily working as independent journalist, I'm quite fearless. So uh, I don't have any problem, for example, in publishing the arrest records, the names, the booking photos, the various statements that these individuals have made. Um, whereas, in, you know, an establishment press, um, they may find uh, they won't publish that, those type of details. But for me, I often kind of unmask them, um, oh, sometimes kind of literally in a way, right? And uh, so they find me as an existential threat. And I think because there's so few others who have been willing to step up, um, unfortunately, it causes like all the attention to be focused on me and therefore the threats and, and even the violence. And then how also to Andy, can we share stories like Gabriel getting out of Antifa? More of those, because I'm sure they are leaving in droves because of people like you actually sharing the truth and opening up their eyes to show, hey, this whole deconstructionist movement, everything you're doing to try to destroy the United States of America, it's wrong, it's ruining you, and it could ruin future generations. What's, how can we share some more of those stories of people leaving Antifa? Mm, I think you're a bit more optimistic than, hmm. than me. Uh, I think stories like um, Gabriel Nadalas, who really had a change of heart and now is trying to undo some of the damage he did in his youth, I think that's actually really rare. Um, at the ground level, a lot of these Antifa cells or groups and movements operate essentially as a game. If you dare to leave, it's one thing to leave. Some people, you know, they become a bit less radical and they just stop getting involved in the rioting, for example, or the direct action. But if you go out publicly and you start denouncing the people that you are a part of, they will get you. They will either go threaten you, they'll publish where you live, they'll publish information about your family. And those threats of violence have been very effective. So I've had had a few people reach out to me privately and off the record about how they were involved in this stuff and really found, later found it to be distasteful and left it. But they, cannot speak on record under their real names. They can't give me an interview on camera or anything because these people would threaten to kill them and would destroy their lives. It's understandable in the world that we're living in with political violence becoming so mainstream. Luckily, we have so many conservative and just pro-America and pro-freedom activists, let alone their political affiliation, wanting to share these stories, wanting to expose the truth about Antifa, about the radical left, and just how tactical they are in their measures to take down the United States. Unfortunately, what we see with that is that a lot of those events or activism opportunities or content end up getting censored or canceled like we saw with your experience at Dartmouth. What words of encouragement do you have for students who are wanting to get these stories out there and for the next generation to push back against that censorship? Um, I think people who care about free expression and making sure that not only is it protected at the legal level, but protected and, and it continues to be the norm socially and culturally in America, you have to get involved. You have to get involved, unfortunately, into these institutions that are compromised, you know, whether it be local politics or local media or national media. It's important. I think part of the reason why the radical and far left have been able to cause so much damage and, and wreak havoc uh, with impunity is because they have so many people and powerful institutions protecting them. And uh, in many ways, the right, uh, in my opinion, has ceded that ground and just sort of so thinks that, well, you know, there's nothing we can do, but, you know, these institutions remain really powerful. And I think um, if you can get involved in local government, do it. Uh, I've been encouraged, for example, at like a really small local level to see how parents are being much more vocal about their children's education. And you can see um, that politically that has um, the ramifications further down and it also empowers other people to speak out. And then finally, as we're wrapping up here, Andy, we want to thank you again so much for spending time with us. And we're always praying for your safety and we always really, really appreciate your courage. Where can people find your book, Unmasked, and where can they find you on social media? Thank you, first of all. Um, my book is uh, being released in a new updated paperback form on the 1st of February, and that'll be available on Amazon, wherever books are sold. So you'll, in that, you'll see new information about what Antifa we're doing in 2021. Um, and uh, I, I would ask that people uh, support me on ngo.locals.com. Well, Andy, thanks again so much for joining us. Best of luck with everything, and we really, really appreciate you.
My pleasure.